meeting today, and I think I'm coming down with a cold, so we'll see how long I can make it. Um, today's a huge day in terms of political marketing. The election is today. I know a lot of students tell me things like, well, in Oklahoma, our vote really doesn't count because of the Electoral College. And so uh, just remember that it does count in terms of providing whoever wins the presidency whether or not they can claim a mandate based on the popular vote. So it counts in that way. It also counts because we have down ballot races and in Oklahoma we have a number and they've done a lot of advertising recently of all of the state questions and initiatives that have been on the ballot. And so that's another thing that um, you should remember that it's not just the presidency. There are other elections and those elections matter. And those ballot initiatives matter towards the quality of life that we'll have here in Oklahoma. And you want your voice to be heard in those, and so that's important. So last week I had to go to competition to the International Fleet and Sales Competition, and I had Dr. Morelli uh, take over for me. I did not think that he could possibly operate the camera and do PowerPoint. He's not the most technologically. I, I love my colleague to death, but he's not the most technologically advanced or sophisticated person. And so I didn't ask him to run the camera for me. Luckily, though, I have three years of videos of this class from other semesters that I can post. So I will post the topics that he talked about um, last week for you. You got your exams back. If you didn't get your exam back, I don't have those. He still has them. I haven't had a chance to run over to his office because we got back uh, late yesterday. So we need to talk about services today. We're also supposed to talk about price, but I'm going to not do that pricing chapter until after we do the group presentations. So services. Services are an increasingly important part of our economy. They're making up a bigger and bigger percentage of our economy. And one of the things that you've heard in this presidential election is about the types of jobs that we are losing in our economy. It is estimated that 50% of the jobs in existence today will not be in existence in 15 years. And I, was, I heard this statistic on NPR one morning, and I was prepared to be doubtful of that statistic until I went to Sam's for my business that morning and <clears throat> saw this. What is this? It's a free ask. How many of you have been to Sam's and seen this? So they used to have these people that passed out samples that provided a service, which was what? To Sam's and Sam's customers. The ability to try different things in Sam's. And they're now replacing these people with what? Free offs. And one of the things that we talked about in services is, can you uh, deliver the service through automation? And so we'll talk about that in a minute. But it's important because one of the things that we're talking about as a country is, what we're going to do in terms of bringing jobs back. And one of the people that I heard on the news this morning was saying, well, you know, probably the coal miners are just going to have to realize that those jobs are not coming back. You know, I mean, the harsh reality, he says, no, no politician wants to say this, and he's not running for office. This was one of the pundits that was on television. He was saying, those jobs are just not going to come back. We're now going to move away from coal. I have my boat at the port of Muskogee, and there is a power plant right next to that port that dumps massive amounts of coal dust onto our port. And so they wash off our boats uh, once a week for us. As a result of that, two of those burners are already being converted to natural gas burners to be cleaner, efficient, more efficient industry. And by the end of 2019, all three of those firing burners will be off of coal and will be natural gas. And so where are the economy or where are the jobs growing in our economy? A lot of them are growing in services. And it's those high knowledge industries that are the ones that are really growing. Legal services, financial services, things like that, that are, are becoming an ever-increasing part of our um, economy. Services marketing scholars like Mary Jo Bittner, this is a test question, argue that all goods are really services. You don't like the thing for in and of itself. You're not like Gollum and Lord of the uh, Rings, right? My practice. Looking at your hamburger from McDonald's. 
you value that hamburger from McDonald's for what? Oh uh, yeah, it's convenience that it, it serves a, 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 a need that you have. It's the service that it provides, which is it satisfies your hunger. Maybe. <laughs> Nutrition or lack thereof. Right? So she argues that all products are really services. Can you think of one exception to this? Something that you might value in and of itself. Not just for the service it provides. So, you know, what do I value about the cufflinks? Well, I have all these French cuff shirts. Um, you have to have cufflinks in order to get the, the sleeves to stay closed, right? That's what I value. Uh, the service that it provides is the closing of the sleeves so that they're not just open and floppy. That's the service I get from the cufflinks. What's the service I get from the jacket that I'm wearing? Well, it's, you know, provides warmth. Or maybe it's a superfluous article of clothing that we should do away with. I don't know. That's the reason I wear bow ties. Ties are completely superfluous articles of clothing that we should have done away with. It's a remnant of a bib that people wore to keep food from getting on their shirts. Well, that's what the evolution of the tie comes from. If you're going to wear a superfluous article of clothing, it might as well be completely ridiculous, right? So that's why we're the bow ties. Because the court rules say, as an attorney, I have to wear a tie. So why do I? Well, I, I wear the tie because the court rules say I have to have it. The services that it allows me to get into court, right, as an attorney. So maybe, I don't know, maybe the jacket is equally superfluous. I don't know. But the service that it could provide is more fashion. What else? Style, things like that. What? A status, aesthetics, things like that. Is there anything that you can think of that maybe we value in and of itself for its own sake? That's not a service, any product. Gold? Uh, the value of gold is completely arbitrary, isn't it? Right? I mean, but yeah, I mean, but don't we value that for the service that it provides? What does it say? Well, your wedding band says what? I'm married, right? It's a style. Maybe art. Art is something that maybe we value in and of itself for its own sake. Although Bittner would say that you still value it for the service that it provides. What is that? Yeah, the way it makes you feel, the decoration on your wall, the status it provides you. Um, but maybe art is the one thing that, that um, we might value in and of itself. Services have increased. The value of services has increased in our GDP for 100% since 1990. And 70, $722 billion in services are exported um, in the, from the United States in 2014, which is the last year that the text had data. And I haven't looked at the Census Bureau's data since then. Um, this is one of the areas where we have a trade surplus with other nations. So we actually have a trade surplus in terms of services. And again, what are those services that are really of value? Well, they're financial services. They're legal services that we provide, accounting services and things like that, um, that really make up you know, uh, a big part of our economy now. So when we talk about the key part of product, we also include, uh, in, in the product part of the four Ps, we include services in that. So we say, for example, that financial services offer products. Banking, we say, offer you products, even though they're not tangible things, right? What is it that is the product that the bank offers you? Well, it's the uh, ability to deposit your money and keep it safe um, in a secure location, and it's protected up to $200,000 if it's an FDIC or FSLIC insured. Uh, institution. What else do they provide? What other products do they provide you? Interest-bearing accounts. Interest-bearing accounts, right? Uh, we say that's a product, but it's not really. It's an intangible. What is it really that you're, you're valuing there? Put your money somewhere and have it be able to easily be transferred without having to carry around large sums of cash, right? These greenback dollars. So we talk about those as products, but really they're intangibles. What is it that you value? It's not the tangible product that they give you when you open a, a checking account or a banking account. They're going to give you some tangibles along with that, but that's not really the thing that you value the most, right? You're, you're valuing the safety and security, and really what is that 
thing. What is the money that goes into that? Well, it's really virtual money. It's a dot on the screen that says that you have this amount in your account balance, right? And so it's this intangible, and, and the safety and convenience of being able to transfer that. So there are four unique aspects of developing services as the product component of a business. Those four I's are intangibility, inconsistency, inconsistency inseparability, and then inventory. Intangible. Services can't be held, touched, or seen before the purchase decision. So I put this up here. This is Progressive Health Center massage therapy provider in Denver. So how are they trying to tell you that, about their services? Well, they've got a picture of a woman getting a massage. She looks thoroughly relaxed and in the zone, doesn't she? But how do you really evaluate that service before you purchase it? How many of you have had a massage? almost everybody. How many of you had a horrific experience with a massage? Why did you have a horrific experience with a massage? <laughs> that would be that would be a little creepy, wouldn't it? Yeah. My brother, my my brother and his wife and my mother and I and a bunch of our family went out the day after Thanksgiving like so many families do to go shopping, which is called what? What's that they call it? Black Friday. Black Friday, it's one of the biggest days in retail. 50% of all retail sales have some aspect or involved in some way with Christmas shopping, and so Black Friday is one of those huge days. It's a big tradition for a lot of people to run right out and try and find these deals of the lifetime, right? Which is really interesting in my family because we're all Jewish. Well, my brother's a Roman Catholic, but his wife's a Jew, my mother's a Jew, and yeah, we're out Christmas shopping the day after Thanksgiving. And my mother is like on a Batan death march to go shopping with. I mean, she is, and so about 3.30 in the afternoon, my brother and I were carrying these huge piles. Of my, I'm carrying bags for my mother. He's carrying bags for his wife. Of all of this stuff that they bought, we decided that we were gonna get a massage at one of those places in the middle of the mall. And it was the most horrific experience of my life. I mean, these people looked like they were like, I, I mean, I felt like I had had somebody beat me with every kind of implement. I mean, this guy, he was grinding his elbow into my back. I mean, it was just, it was awful. How do you, and how do you evaluate that before you get it, really, right? You don't know until you get it. So we try to, to picture these things, but they're very difficult to evaluate. This is a credence property problem that we have. How do you evaluate the quality of the services? Let's think about something from my own professional career. How do you evaluate the quality of a lawyer? What? Did I go to jail? Did I go to jail? Okay. Can you really evaluate the quality of a lawyer based on <laughs> did I go to jail? No. Recommendations. Recommendations from other people. Okay. <coughs> so I had a friend who was getting a divorce and he asked me if I would do his divorce. And I said, no, I don't do divorce law. When I first got out of law school, I took some divorce cases. And I was remarkably bad at this. Because people would come in, and this is a traumatic experience, and they would start crying, and I would say things like, I cannot help you if you're in this state. You need to come back when, when, you, can, when you can answer my questions from a rational, comprehensive perspective. That's, you know, I mean, what they wanted was a tissue and some empathy, and, and I just don't have a lot of that. I, I mean, I've been divorced three times, um, you know, and it, but I'm just not a terribly empathetic person. I suffer from um, a personality disorder called, uh, um, what? No, it's, it's called disaffected personality syndrome, um, which is you have, an, you have an inability to empathize with, with people. I, uh, I do tell students that I can empathize with you, but I don't have a lot of sympathy for you because I did sit where you sat at one point in time. 
But I was not terribly effective at this, and so I said, no, I won't take your divorce case. And he said, well, can you recommend someone to me for my divorce case? And I said, Anita Sanders, she's the best. If you, if you want a really good, I, I, the best is um, probably an attorney called uh, Michael Levy, but he's almost impossible to get. And I said, Anita's the next best one out there. And he gets on Angie's list. <laughs> and he comes back and he says, do you have another recommendation? Because she has horrible ratings on Angie's list. And I said, well, Paul, I don't think Angie's list is a good evaluation of, of legal. I mean, here's the problem with practicing divorce law. Half of your stuff is going to walk out the door. Because we are not a community property state in Oklahoma, but we function like a community property state, which means that they're going to divide stuff pretty much 50-50. And when half of your stuff walks out the door, you're not happy. And so, he's, he, so he starts looking at all these other divorce lawyers, and oddly enough, they all had bad reviews on Angie's list. And why is that? Because no, divorce doesn't happen in church. People are not happy. So how do you evaluate the effectiveness or the quality of a lawyer? Somebody else give me a criterion that we can use to evaluate. Can you look at that lawyer's track record? The track record, that's one that, that's one that, that would seem to be an objective standard, right? And this seems like a good about Win-loss ratio. I want the guy who wins. In the words of Donald Trump, I don't like John McCain because John McCain got caught. I want guys who don't get caught. Right? That's what he said. Win-loss ratio. Some of the <coughs> dumbest people in my law school class have excellent win records. Do you know why? They went to be public prosecutors. Now, if you can't figure out, when I graduated from law school, from Oklahoma City University School of Law, I was paying $850 an accredited hour for law school. It's now over $1,200 an accredited hour to go to Oklahoma City University School of Law. If you can't figure out what do public prosecutors, uh, district attorneys in Oklahoma make, they make about $45,000. So you're going to graduate with a law debt of over $100,000 if you're not paying for this in student loans. And if you can't do the math to figure out that you can't service the debt and live, you're not real bright. Some of the dumbest people I went to law school with are district attorneys. They have great win-loss ratios. Why is that? Because the criminals are dumber than them. <laughs> Right? I mean, if you can't figure out the math on this, you're not right, folks. If you can't figure out that you're going to OCU paying $1,200 an accredited hour or more, and you can't service the debt, you're not real bright. So how are we going to evaluate lawyers? And some of the brightest attorneys I knew were criminal defense lawyers who have horrible win-loss ratios. Why? Yeah, it's hard. To, I mean, when your clients are getting in trouble when they have the cocaina on them, it, it's, it's difficult to, to get them off. You know, what you do is you work to get the best deal but they're that you can. Huh? They're reoccurring clients. Right? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so these are really tough ways of evaluating. Well, how do you evaluate? Well, you, I think you evaluate lawyers based on, there's a rating system where we rate our peers, and I think that's probably a good way of looking at it, because I have some ability to assess whether or not other lawyers actually know what they're doing based on my interaction with them. It's not a perfect system, because to some extent, our, our evaluations of other lawyers are influenced by what? Whether or not we like them, right? But um, it's a better system than, than maybe looking at Angie's list, where if you look at the Angie's list for criminal defense, I bet most of those criminal defendants, if they can get on Angie's list, don't like their attorney if they went to jail. But not every case could be. 
can be one. How do you evaluate medical services? This is another one that's very difficult, right? Not every cancer can be cured. And so does that mean that the doctor is not a good doctor? If you look at oncologists who specialize in pancreatic cancer, they have miserable success rates. Does that make them a bad doctor? Probably not. So these are, are very difficult things to evaluate. It makes services really, really unique. Inconsistency. Because they're not standard protocols that we can always put into place, Every case is somewhat unique that a lawyer will have. There is going to be inconsistency in the quality of the services. They're not tangible products. We can make this iPhone with very exact specifications so that it controls my camera over there, right? It will uh, function with the app that allows me to control the camera. How do you do that with legal services when somebody comes in the, the office and says, I get it, get me off. You know, yep, had the, had the 18 pounds of coke in the back seat of the car, um, was on my way to sell it, you know, I don't know, in New Jersey or wherever, and now I just want you to get me off. Well, you know, I'm going to have to look at the facts of that situation and see if I can do something like get the evidence thrown out on a Fourth Amendment uh, issue or something like that. So it's hard to standardize them. So quality can vary with each service provider's capabilities. Right? If you're a baby lawyer who's just graduated, you're probably not going to be as good as somebody who's been doing this for 20 years. And that's hard to, to uh, standardize. Pricing, promotion, and delivery of services is difficult because of this inconsistency. How do you charge? Um, a lot of lawyers charge based on their, their knowledge level. As they gain knowledge level, as you become a partner in a firm, you generally charge more than associates who are supervised by partners. Uh, and so there are some set, some set standards sort of in the legal profession, but it can be difficult. What do, you, what do you charge somebody who wants a lot of different things? Think about, again, going to the massage. There's everything from the massage people in the mall that are out there in the middle, who I suggest that if you want to walk uh, normally, don't go to them. I, I don't know. Maybe there are some good ones, and maybe I just got a really bad one. To massage envy, to high end services. And one of the things that I was listening to a presentation on by a faculty member who was talking about services and this idea of the salon is that really, what is our opinion of these services become? Because she said, you know, when I first started going and getting massages. Years ago, it was sort of a special treat. You went to a massage, you went to a salon that was sort of upscale, it was a whole day of, of activity. Now, where do they have massage envy? Okay, so you got the guys out in the middle of the mall, where are massage envies located for the most part? They're located in strip malls. And it's not exactly the same, right? So there's this range of quality. And how do you price that? All the way from the guy who's doing it for 15 minutes, you know, with your clothes uh, fully on in the middle of the mall to uh, somebody who wants a full day of luxury, right? So um, that can lead to pricing issues. Um, how do we reduce these? What do organizations and businesses do to try and reduce this inconsistency? Well, you try to come up with ways to standardize it through training. Inseparability. This is closely related to inconsistency. Consumers cannot separate the delivery from the provider itself or the service or the, their perception of the business. If you have a bad experience at Massage Envy with one provider, can you really separate that out from your feeling about the business? Becomes difficult, right? Um, the interaction between the provider and the consumer means that they really do, when we talk about this era of value co-creation, really need to engage in value co-creation together. An interaction is going to depend on and the extent to which the customer um, might be satisfied and the extent to which they have to be present. So there are differences, again, between services, and we'll talk about the classification of services, between something like dry cleaning, which you can standardize fairly well, right? 
What are you supposed to do when you take your shirts to the dry cleaner? Well, you want to get them cleaned and pressed so that they have no wrinkles, they don't smell, and you can do that in a fairly systematic way, but it's harder with legal or medical services where everyone is somewhat unique and their situations are somewhat unique. Finally, inventory. Inventory for products may be problematic if the product is perishable. So one of the things that they do, if you go to Die for Less, right? Anybody been to the Die for Less? It's Buy for Less. That's what I buy. Um, okay. The Buy for Less on Northwest Expressway. Anybody been in there? Okay. If you go in there, how do they have you shop? Well, you come in, you go instantly to the right, and they force you to walk past all of those perishable items first. The lettuce, the produce and stuff like that. Why is that? Well, because the inventory cost for that stuff is pretty high for grocery stores because of spoilage. They have to throw a lot of that stuff out, so they're trying to encourage you to buy that stuff that has an inventory carrying cost. But a lot of products, if you go to the center of the store where they have packaged goods, are not necessarily perishable. So if I don't sell the macaroni today, I still am not necessarily out any money because I can sell it when? Tomorrow. Tomorrow. Not true with services, right? As a lawyer, if I'm not billing right now, I can never get this time back, right? I can never, I can never make up for this time. It's an inventory cost that I can't, that I can't make up for, because today is gone, right? And I only have a, so much time in my life, um, and so the inventory costs are really unique in, in services in that uh, it can cost a lot. So law firms, what do law firms want you to do? Well, if you're hired as a law firm and an associate, in order to pay for yourself and pay for, make it profitable for the firm to hire you, they're going to want you to bill 1,900 hours. This can become problematic. This is the reason that doctors also have this problem, because insurance companies want you, in order to be profitable, to see as many patients as you can in a day what is the average time a general practitioner can take with you if they want to be profitable? Five minutes. Five minutes is what a general practitioner has to come in and diagnose you if they want to be profitable with insurance companies. Lawyers, they want you to bill 1,900 hours. How many hours are there in a work year? How many weeks are there in a work year? 52. 52. If we multiply 52 by 40, that comes out to 2080, if I did my math correctly, right? Figure that you have 80 hours for vacation, two weeks of vacation is standard, that leaves 2,000 hours. They want you to bill 1,900. What do you have left over? 100 hours. If you want to bill 1,900 hours in a year, you're going to have to work 60 to 80 hours a week to get that done. So, with my friends who are in law firms, I'm no longer in a law firm, but with my friends who are in law firms, I'll say things like, you get two weeks, and they're like, yeah, but I still have to, I mean, ultimately I have to bill the, the number of hours that they want me to bill in order to make partner, and if I'm not billing this week, I'm just going to have to double up next week in order to get to that number, because you, it's impossible to bill for every hour that you're at work, right? There's times when you've got to go to the water cooler or eat lunch or do things like that. So these inventory costs are, are really different and unique for services than they are in many um, <clears throat> product businesses. So many companies are not clearly just a product or a service-based company, but they're both. They're a combination of both, and whether or not they provide one or more of the other depends on the type of company they are. But a lot of them really are service companies. So we bought a copier for the college business that's upstairs in room 203. I talk a lot about copiers because I'm sort of fascinated by them in terms of the progression of what they can do these days. And along with that comes a service contract. So are they primarily a product provider? Was R.K. Black, who sold us the, the copier, primarily a seller of a product or primarily a seller of the service? The service contracts are actually a significant portion of their business, probably 40% of their business is service contracts. 
And why do we have to have that service contract? Well, these copiers, when my mother had a real estate company back in the 1980s, copiers were made by Xerox. That was the major copy that made them. There's, they're not the major player in copiers anymore. There's lots of other companies that sell copiers. But you lifted up the lid, you put your piece of paper on there, and it made a copy. This was fascinating. And nobody had copiers back in the 1980s that would have an automatic feed so that you could sort one. I mean, I remember the first time I saw a copier with an automatic feed. That was really high tech. You no longer had to open the lid, put the copy down, and, and you know, do that for each page, which could take a long time. Well, all of these parts are moving. And the more parts that move, the more likely you're going to have what? Have malfunctions. And now the copiers not just have an automatic feeder, they also have what? What else will the copier do? Well, it'll sort, it'll staple, it will hole punch, it will collate, it will duplex, right? The double sided. So all of these things add. And so the service is actually a big part of that. So when we look at this, we distinguish between the company's core offerings. Are they primarily a product company that offers services along with those products? And in the business to business world, you're going to find a lot that are more and more um, services uh, with as their core part of their company, maybe. Um, so for example, Dell manufactures computers, but they also have customer support. And that's a huge part of their business. So classifying services. We classify services by the methods of delivery. People, lawyers, doctors, accountants, or equipment. What are services that the bank offers that we can automate? Well, um, what, are the, what does the bank offer that's automated, that's offered by a machine? ATM. Bill pay, ATMs, online banking, things like that. Electric utilities. There's very little involvement between you and the electric company, right? It's primarily an automated service that comes to your house and they send you a bill. Um, and they now have, it used to be that they used to send people out to read the meters on the back of your house. A lot of electric companies now have what? Yeah, they have smart readers that send the reading automatically to them. So there's even less contact with people. We can also classify them as profit or for-profit or non-profit. So lots of organizations provide services. In the nonprofit sphere, things like the Red Cross is a big one that provides services um, for, for uh, people and constituencies. And then government sponsored. And more and more, governments are relying on marketing to talk about their services. You wouldn't think of a police department as having a marketing department, but lots of them do in terms of community outreach to try and connect with the people that they serve. And it's becoming increasingly important, particularly in large inner cities where there have been lots of problems between the police and protesters. And we have those at the federal, state, local level, the United States Postal Service, fire, police, roads, highways, things like that. So how do consumers purchase services? How do you buy services? How is it different from products? Well, a lot of you are now doing the same thing. I suggested to you that my friend who wanted to have a divorce lawyer recommendation asked me about uh, my recommendation. And then he went on Angie's list and started looking for a lawyer and got uh, information that way. Um, how else do we market or how else do we find services? For example, one of the things that we talked about before when we were talking about goods are unsought goods. A lot of services provide unsought services, like what? Well, records. You don't generally have, do any of you have your favorite wrecking company on speed dial? No? Nobody, nobody knows their wrecker service by heart? Nobody in here drives a Jaguar? Any of the British, I know. Maserati, they're another one. The Italians have beautiful cars that are horribly inconsistent in their ability to perform. No, you don't, right? So how do you market that? How do you get your business out there? 
Web pages, um, a lot of them do it through aggregation, right? Through AAA services. They become members of AAA so that when you call and you're on the roadside, if you have AAA, they'll refer you to the service provider that's the closest in your area. So understanding how consumers make service purchasing decisions. More and more and increasingly, whether we like it as attorneys, people are turning to things like Yanchi's List for reviews. And so I would suggest that lawyers actually take the time to go out there and read these reviews. For my family's business, we constantly monitor social networking and social uh, sites like TripAdvisor and Travelocity that have rating services for those kinds of businesses. So how, how customers evaluate the services. It used to be, and we'll talk more about this when we talk about integrated marketing communication as well, that we used to say in the olden days when I first started teaching marketing back in the uh, era of uh, you know, writing on uh, tablets and, and scribes, that if people really liked your business, they might tell three people about you. If they hated your business, they would tell 10 people about you. That is no longer true. If they like your business, the likelihood of them going on to a social networking site like TripAdvisor, Travelocity, Angie's List, something like that, and talking about you, are, you know, maybe one in three. But when they do do that, how many people are they talking to? A lot. And if they hate you, the odds of them posting it, not just on one website, but on every single website that they can think of, increase exponentially and what are they going to do? They're not telling 10 people, they are now telling what? The world, right? My colleagues are horrified that I suggest to you that as a service provider, one of the things that you should do, how many of you get on ratemyprofessor.com and look at the reviews? My colleagues are horrified that I tell you about this site because they, you know, they think, I, I think you ought to look at it. I'm not saying that you should necessarily avoid professors that you see that are hard, but when you see, for example, I have one colleague who's no longer with us, so I'll tell you who she is. She's retired. Thank God. Years ago, her name was Ann Lynch, and everything said, like, unless you want to fail, do not take this class. Uh, you know, every review was like that. You, you might uh, look at those, right? And then determine how we can present our relative competitive advantage in those fields. What makes us competitive? What makes massage envy? Let's think about this. So again, those of you who are concerned about your test scores and want to know how to think about this, think about these kinds of examples and then start coming up with them for yourself on things like this. So I'm giving you an example. How do you determine what your competitive advantage is in an offering? What gives massage envy a competitive advantage in the massage uh, in, in the massage industry. It's what? Price point. I think it's price point and what else? Quick convenience. I think it's price point and convenience. They are located where? Well, they've opened these these franchises in a lot of different places. They're located in strip malls. If you go to a high-end salon, so I went to the ICSC again. For those of you that are interested in sales, this is one of the ways you can get the university to pay for your trips. We took two students to competi to competition at ICSC. The competition is held in Orlando at a resort. The resort had a salon along with it. It had this huge pool and it had several water slides and lots of um, hot tubs and arcades and stuff like that that our students got to take advantage of while they were at the competition. And the school pays for all of that for us to travel. And actually, we get reimbursed for the competition for those because there are all of these companies that come that want to recruit our students there, and they pay huge sponsorship fees to be a part of this competition. But there's this high-end salon in the resort that we stayed at, right? And basically, if you wanted to get booked in there, I called just to see if I could get booked in. They were booked for several weeks in advance by people who had already planned their vacations out. And were coming to Orlando to, to stay at this resort. Historically, high-end salons and high-end spas, you would have to book in advance. And if you wanted a particular uh, massage therapist, you might have to really, really plan that out in advance. And they have sort of standard clientele. 
What is it that gives Massage Envy the same? I think you're right. It's the price point. How much is it to get a massage at Massage Envy compared to a high-end salon? If you're going to a high-end spa and salon, what are you going to pay for a massage, for a 60-minute massage? About $100. Yeah, you're going to pay about $100 plus you're going to have what? Tip. Tip, right? So you're looking at over 100 bucks. What is it at Massage Envy for a, for a 60 minutes? $29. It's not twenty nine ninety five. <laughs> I think it's about a dollar a minute, which is considerably less than what you pay for at the high end salon. And they also have deals where if you will give them an automatic draft on your bank, so that you get a, a massage once a month or whatever, um, they'll give you a discount on that price. And what are they relying on? Yeah, that you're repeating, and that some people won't use the, the service, right? So how do we present your product in uh, a competitive way. Assessing quality. So consumers compare their expectations of what they want to service with what, they actually, what their actual experience is. And one of the things that we want to do as a business is we want to ensure that those expectations meet or come up to some level of the consumer's expectations in order to stay in business. How are we going to do that? Well, we can do it through a gap analysis on factors, things, uh, factors such as reliability. How reliable is the service? Well, are you able to use it uh, quickly and efficiently? The tangible products. So law firms, for example, what is it that they're going to do to help promote themselves and, and present a reliable, tangible Product well, the papers that you get from the lawyer, what they should be what? They should look professional and legal, and the, the contact and stuff like that that you have with them. The responsiveness, how quickly you are able to deal with complaints. Now, one of the interesting areas with regard to responsiveness is that if you have a services failure and you recover quickly in terms of your responsiveness, the services literature suggests that people are actually happier than they would be if you didn't have a services failure. Now this presents an ethical dilemma. Should you plan certain services failures so that you can recover quickly and have more satisfied customers? I'll give you an example. How many of you have flown on an airline and had the airline tell you that they needed volunteers because their flight was overbooked? A lot of you. How many of you took them up on that? Why? They offered a lot of miles in order in exchange for your. Were you happier? Yeah. That's technically a services failure. Were you happier? Why? You got moved up to first class. Okay, that's Southwest does this a lot. They'll ask, you know, if the flight is overbooked, and airlines do this because they a lot of times their systems predict that there will be last minute cancellations of people, so they overbook flights. And then they rely if they actually have an overbooking on people coming and saying, you know, I will volunteer to give up my seat in exchange for, you know, free tickets uh, in the future or an upgrade to first class in the next flight. And studies show that, that customers are actually happier if that happens. Now, if you don't recover quickly, what happens? Nothing. Yeah, they're really not happy. And guess what happens? Pitchforks. Yeah, they start on social media, right? In this day and age, you get on your phone, your iPhone, and start uh, texting everybody you know and posting it, you know, this is the worst service I've ever gotten. Assurance. Um, giving people the assurance that, they're, that the quality is going to be there, that you will make up or you will make good on services failures. And finally, a big part of this is empathy. Studies in the medical marketing literature now suggest that whether or not a doctor will be sued is dependent upon whether or not the patient has a good experience with that doctor in the first five minutes of their meeting. Whether or not they feel empathy from that doctor and whether or not they feel like the doctor really cares about them. Not necessarily the quality of the, of the medical uh, service provided, but if they feel that the doctor is, is empathetic, they're less likely to sue if something goes uh, wrong. Any questions about services? All right, so we're um, a little bit ahead of schedule here. So you have about 20 minutes 
um, to work in your groups, to put those last minute touches on in your presentations. A lot of you have asked me about bonus points. I don't generally give additional assignments for bonus points. What I do is if you give exceptional performance on the critical thinking, you have the opportunity to win bonus points that way. If you did an exceptional paper, I gave people bonus points for their individual papers, you still have that opportunity. If you turn in an exceptional performance on your group project, and if you turn in an exceptional paper, you have the opportunity to win bonus points. So I'm giving you time now to get with your groups and really figure out how it is that you are going to uh, get that exceptional performance and maybe win those bonus points, all right? Any questions? All right.